Next, I'd like to invite a close friend and a trailblazing oculoplastic surgeon of our generation, Dr. Akshay Nair. He's attached to the Advanced Eye Hospital and Aditya Jyoti Eye Hospital. He's also an honorary consultant at Lokmanya Tilak Medical College and Hospital. So Akshay will be eyeballing all the implants and inserts in brief that we cover in oculoplastics. Over to you, Akshay. Thank you so much, Dr. Prerna, for that introduction. Yeah. I'll just take a brief second. We also have Dr. Shalu Bageja with us. She's also a senior oculoplasty consultant uh, in Delhi. And we have Dr. Chandana no. Chakrabarti here Sorry. from West Bengal who has interest in oculoplastics and a senior ophthalmologist with a lot of experience in the same. Thank you. So I'll be speaking on implants and inserts in oculoplastic surgery. Uh, these are my financial disclosures. Uh, we have received lecture fees from Carl Zeiss Meritic, a few of which products will be shown in this presentation. So the aim and scope of this talk is to give a brief introduction with all the implants and inserts that we put in the eye, the eyelids, the socket, and the lacrimal system. Essentially, the simple and common oculoplastic surgeries that every general ophthalmologist may have to perform. And when do we use these implants? Now, a lot of these surgeries can be done with or without these implants. And therefore, it's important to know what scenarios do we actually use them. Say, for example, a DCR stent. When do we need to put it? When do we need to remove it? So uh, I'll categorize this talk into three sections, which is eyelid surgery, lacrimal surgery, and orbital surgery, and cover these implants on the level of the material that it, it basically is made of, the indications where we have to implant them, some complications, and other important things that we need to know. What I will not be covering in this talk is trauma, and patient-specific implants because these, I believe, are at completely different advanced level of implants that may not be within the scope of this topic. So in ptosis, typically, of course, we know there are, there's a fascinella servat, a levator type surgeries, and a conjunctival Mueller's muscle resection, and the tarsofrontalis sling, which is where our implant comes in. Now, a sling is performed to harness the action of the frontalis muscle to elevate the hyalid, and hence the name tarsofrontalis sling. Now, what categorizes a, a, a good material to be used as a sling? It has to be available. It has to be biocompatible. You do not want adverse reactions uh, to the material being used. It has to be reversible and adjustable. Children, especially when, the, when these patients are operated at a young age, tend to grow. There can be an, a, a loosening of the sling and therefore you have to be able to adjust it and it has to be flexible non-biodegradable because then the effect is lost, ease of handling and biointegrable makes the surgery long-lasting. And of all these materials that are commonly used, the most important one being silicon. Now if you go back to that checklist and see how silicon performs, apart from being biointegrable, which is a good thing, for, apart from not being biointegrable, which is a good thing for silicon, this literally ticks all the boxes. And you can see uh, it usually is available uh, swaged on the needle, uh, or two needles, with a silicone sleeve. A lot of surgeons can also prefer to snip the silicone sling into two and use one for each eye, although each silicone sling unit is meant to be used in one eye. The indications, the most common being severe ptosis and poor levator function. Other indications could include Marcus gun jaw winking phenomenon. Common complications that we uh, end up encountering are a sling or a sleeve extrusion with an infection at the wound site or epitarsal migration wherein the sling slips up from the tarsal height, tarsus, level of the tarsus into the uh, supratarsal space. So the next eyelid surgery that I'm going to talk about is one that is used to treat lagophthalmus. 
Now, whenever we see lag of thalamus, typically following Bell's pulse, we assess the patient based on the following parameters. The Bell's phenomenon, the amount of corneal exposure, and therefore, the amount of corneal exposure keratopathy that the patient has. And there are different techniques to treat it. For example, a suture tarsorafi, a permanent tarsorafi. A lot of surgeons have even tried hyaluronic acid filler in the supratarsal space to bring the eyelid down. Uh, one of the commonest uh, surgeries that is done is a gold weight or a plat platinum weight implant. Now, these are available in a set and each of these uh, weights can be tried in the clinic by using a, a cellophane tape and sticking up on the eyelid. The weight that is used in surgery is the least amount, that is the lightest weight that closes the eye completely on a spontaneous blink. So you don't want to overload the eye, at the same time you don't want to underload the eye such that the lack of thalamus persists even after. The most common, uh, the, the, or rather the most important thing is to obtain surgical grade pure metal, which has to be pure gold or pure titanium, which unfortunately is a little difficult to procure in India. The surgically the most important step is to create a submuscular pocket. There has to be a layer of orbicularis that covers this implant. And as you can see, the superior edge of the tarsus is exposed because that is where the implant rides. The implant should not be low at the lower edge of the tarsus. And then you can, with the holes on the implant, you can either use an absorbable or a non-absorbable. Some surgeons like to use different through different eyelets of the implant. The non-absorbable suture fastens the implant. The absorbable sutures induces scarring and holds it in place. But that doesn't mean it's without complications. Implant migration, where it can go superficial, it can go deep, it can come up, extrude out, or it can uh, descend down into the lower edge of the eyelid. <coughs> Excuse me. And infection related issues are also there. The next topic that I'm going to talk about is implants used in lacrimal surgery. Now, one way to classify these implants can be based on the location of the site that they are used, which is in the punctum or the canaliculus or following DCR surgery for uh, nasolacrimal duct obstruction or in congenital nasolacrimal duct obstruction. I found this diagram which was very useful to classify implants or lacrimal implants based on the location that we place it. Now if you see the first diagram on the top left, you can see it goes through a normal lacrimal sac and comes out through the uh, nasolacrimal duct opening in the middle, uh, below the in, in middle meatus. Now that is done in congenital nasolacrimal duct obstruction where a probing is done, the opening is opened out and then a bicanalicular tube is placed. It can also be done for functioning LLDO in adults. The other one, the second one in the middle on top, you can see is a, in, is a canalicular, bicanalicular stent that goes through the puncta and comes out straight through the canaliculus. Now this is typically <coughs> a stent that has been placed in with the help of a pigtail probe for canalicular trauma. Similarly, the one to its left is one that is used in a monocanalicular trauma. The one below, you can see, is through a DCR ostium, which is for uh, nasolacrimal duct obstruction. And there you see is a, a Jones tube for a CDCR, where it goes, bypasses the sac and through the, through the caruncle goes into the nose. Another way to, is to differentiate them as monocanalicular and bicanalicular stents. <coughs> this is called a monoca Crawford, now which is a mini monoca at one end with a hammer shaped self retaining dilated end which sits in the punctum. A long silicon tube which is swaged on a bodkin, a metal bodkin which is the metal stent which we commonly see in bicanalicular tubes and it is olive tipped. Now this is done in congenital nasolacrimal duct obstruction where you use the probe to open up the uh, uh, membranous block and then introduce the metal bodkin through the nose, re retrieve the bodkin out. Finally, the tube gets, the um, uh, silicon end of the tube gets, uh, you f fix it at the punctum and cut off the redundant amount of tube. So, <coughs> excuse me, it passes through the mono the lower canaliculus and then in through to the nasolacrimal duct outside. Now this is called a masterka, which is essentially a monocanalicular stent which is already mounted on a metal flange. 
So you th using this as a probe, you go out through and through into the nasolacrimal duct, affix the canalicular head at the canalicular or the punctum and retrieve the metal tube out such that it retains itself. And finally, the good old monocanalicular stent or the mini monoca. When do you use them? When, you've treat, when you have a patient with punctal stenosis, peripunctal lesions or tumors, canalicular traumas and canalicular obstruction. I'll quickly run through a short video showing how this is done. <coughs> this is a patient with canalicular trauma. You can see that the canalicular tear and you identify the cut end. Uh, you will see a nice pink ring over there and you can, oh, the mouse is not, yeah, right over here. It's a good idea to irrigate it to see if the fluid actually goes in through the nose. An important step here is that I prefer to give an oblique cut onto the mini monoca such that it has a beveled edge which allows you to easily pass it through the proximal end and also as well into the distal end. Now this is important that to use an atraumatic forcep and gentle traction on the mini monoca helps you enter the punctum and there it is self-retaining. The rest of the surgery is fairly simple where you introduce this into the uh, distal end and pericanalicular anastomosis with an absorbable suture is important. Now this is by far one of the most commonest used stents which is a bicanalicular stent. They are available in 20, 23, 25 and 27 gauge. They can either be straight tipped or olive tipped. Indications are in a DCR <clears throat> where you have small flaps. Excuse me. Uh, where intraoperatively you diagnose canalicular stenosis or obstruction. In cases of repeat DCR, pediatric cases or when there is prolonged surgical duration. What we commonly keep in mind is that the duration at which we remove the stent is between 3 to 6 months. However, that's not the case anymore. It is advised to remove it at 4 weeks because beyond 4 weeks the ostium doesn't heal anymore or contract anymore. You may be justified in keeping it longer if you are treating punctal or canalicular disorders because the risk of a biofilm and a subsequent nidus of infection remains. Complications include prolapse, cheese wiring, granuloma and infection. Now I will quickly run through orbital implants. Why an implant? Now say for example in a thysical eye you eviscerate the eye. <coughs> Excuse me. Once the intraocular contents are removed, the scleral shell loses shape and volume. Which is why you need to address that volume loss by placing an implant within the scleral cavity. And on top of this, a conformer is placed after suturing it. Now an ideal implant therefore has to give you good volume, transmit the processes of the implant to the prosthesis, the motility from the implant to the prosthesis, give you low rates of complications and should be economical and easily available and easy to implant. Without going too much into too much detail, the most common ones used in India are non-integrated, which is PMMA and silicon. Uh, most of us prefer PMMA and when we talk about porous or integrated implant, we talk it, talk, call it integrated because these are blood vessels that integrate into the implant by going in through the pores. Pore size typically has to be between 15, 150 to 400 microns. <clears throat> What's the ideal size? There are different formulae. You can measure the axial length of the other eye and subtract 2 millimeters which will give you the implant diameter. The other option is to use a sizer intraoperatively to know which is the ideal size for the implant. Complications are exposure, extrusion and migration. It is better not to place an implant than to place a very small implant. A small implant like a size 14 or a 16 serves absolutely no purpose. You would rather do a secondary surgery and place a large implant later on than to put a small implant which really does not add volume or transmit any motility to the prosthesis. If you are operating for say a retinoblastoma and are unsure if the child may require radiation or not, put in a non-biointegrable or a non-porous implant 
so such that radiation doesn't cause any complications and always regardless of whether you put in an implant or not please put in a conformer at the end of an evisceration or an enucleation surgery so implants and inserts in oculoplasty are used based on the clinical assessment and the indication during the surgery the material the cost and complications are all the factors that help us decide which implant needs to be used or which does not need to be used at the end of the day these are all aids and means to help improve our surgical outcomes and the quality of lives of our patients thank you thank you akshay that was a wonderful <laughs> coverage of a vast subject gagar me sagar so um with regard to the uh, implants uh, you covered them very well and you covered their properties very well the uh, gold weight implants what i did want to say was that your your simple gold smith will save a lot of money for you so you should use the 999 gold that is in the coffers when you go home open the lockers you will find some bricks so yeah, that, take out so you're, you're talking about your locker not my locker <laughs> <laughs> so those 999 bricks are used for this purpose and you can easily get it made into the right shape you have to just gift one to the goldsmith and he'll make a precise one with holes and costing only a couple of thousand rupees and you can get a very good result with them i've been doing it for years and years now and they would save a lot of money for you that's what i wanted to convey to the audience thank you akshay and thank